Hey, if you've got a Bible with you, you can take it and open it up to Matthew chapter 25. It's where we're going to be at here tonight. And Happy New Year to you guys. I don't know if we're still in that Happy New Year range. It kind of felt like maybe I missed it there. Um, but it's kind of undefined. Like, how long can you still say Happy New Year? But uh, in any case, uh, we are still in that, that range, I think. And we just finished our first full week of the new year. And you know, maybe you're one of those people that set some goals and you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, we got one week down, how am I doing with this? So I wanna get a little, little feel here. If you've set some kind of goal, resolution, plan, initiative, something you wanna accomplish this year, would you raise your hand? Okay, so I don't know, maybe 50, 40, 50% of you or so. So here's an interesting stat uh, that also has the number 23 in it. By this point in the year, 23% of you have failed in your New Year's resolution. <laughs> if you came here for, for some support and encouragement, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But it's so interesting because we start the year and we're always like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. My whole life's going to change on January 1st. It, it's kind of an interesting human uh, kind of uh, habit that we have. And I think it's because we like these little containers of time and we go, okay, I've got one year. I can kind of put it in this container. I can evaluate it. I can think about it later. Pastor Chad last week talked about reflecting back on the previous year and, and learning from that. And so maybe you set some goals. Maybe you set some goals about your health and fitness or exercise. And maybe you set some intellectual goals. I want to read some books. I want to do this. Maybe you set some goals of, hey, I want to you know, spend more time with my family or friends. And, and uh, hopefully you're not in that 23% that have already failed in the first week. And hopefully you're not in the 36% of New Year's resolutions that don't make it into the month of February. And I could, I could talk about why this is, and there's a lot of reasons. And you know, I could talk about how, you know, if you've got a, a health and fitness goal, it's so interesting, because we spend a month basically between Thanksgiving and New Year's just binge eating and eating Christmas cookies and just eating all kinds of junk food and then expect on one day to automatically switch to eating completely clean and no cheat meals and everything's gonna be perfect. And we wonder why we fail. Uh, or maybe if you're like, hey, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna exercise, but we go from this season of like Christmas and New Year's where our exercise consists of like lifting that heavy wreath up on the wall, and like lifting it down, and then expect on January 1st that we're working out like a professional athlete. And we've got all these weird things that we interact with when it comes to goals. But instead of talking about that, I wanna step back a little bit and go, hey, what are, what are the things that we could be setting goals for that, that are a little bit more sustainable? And maybe at the same time, a little bit more significant than how many books we read or what the scale looks like at the end of the year. And so today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25, and Jesus is going to tell a parable here that, that helps us think about how we spend our life. Because we want to live a good life, don't we? We want to, to live a life that we're proud of, a life that, is, that we find successful, life that God would approve of. And uh, in fact, next week we start a really focused look at some of Jesus' teachings on how to build a good life as we look at uh, a, a section of his Sermon on the Mount. But we're going to kind of do a little uh, appetizer to that by looking at Matthew 25 today uh, as he tells a parable that I think will help us think through what do we do with this year. We've got a new calendar year. What do we do with it? And, and maybe how do we end it well and how do we begin well so we have the ending we're looking for? So Matthew 25, we're going to start down in verse 14, and it says this. Jesus is speaking, and he says, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward and bringing the five talents more said, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a litter. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, he who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I have made two talents more. 
And his master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 24, he also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, master, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the grounds. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. And you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and to the one and he will have abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is a, a powerful parable and uh, one that has spoken to me in a lot of situations over the years. But I want to stop and say, okay, what's this, what's this parable have to teach us today? But before we get into that, let's, let's do some definitions. Maybe the, you're not super familiar with this parable. So a talent is a unit of measurement for them. We use that as a synonym for you know, an ability, a skill, something we have the, the capability of doing. But for them, it was a unit of measurement that had to do with finances. So a talent was the equivalent of 20 years pay for a laborer. So for us, for someone that was making minimum wage, that's like $600,000. If you're up near maybe average or a little below average uh, United States income, that's a million dollars. And so for the, the sake of easy math, we're gonna say that one talent e equals like a million dollars just to kind of make it easier for us to, to wrap our head around this. So there's, there's money being put around here, but at the same time, I don't think that this is a lesson on money. Now, certainly, there's some investment principles here. If you take a million dollars and bury it in a hole, and you know, several years later you come back, you might actually have less than a million dollars, depending on how good the container was that you put it in. Um, but this is, this is a lesson that's a bigger picture about how we navigate the things that God entrusts to us. Um, and as we look at this, we see that the, each man was given something important and God came back to say, hey, how did you manage this? How did you take care of this? So a couple lessons here. And the first lesson I think we can glean from this is that God has given us all that we have. Each one of these men w received as a gift, as a, as a entrustment, hey, here it is. You didn't earn this. You didn't do anything for it. I'm giving this to you. They didn't go out and work and say, okay, here is the pay for your work. The master just said, here is some money. Take care of this for me. And when we look at, at stories like this, this is a parable, and I've used that word before. If you're new to this, a parable is a, a, an imaginary story that Jesus used to teach a point. So whenever we're reading and we see Jesus and there's a line that says something like, so the kingdom of God is like, or so it will be like, followed by a story, we know that's a parable, a, a hypothetical story, which means we don't need to dissect every action that these men took because they didn't actually exist. But we look at it and say, what does this have to teach us? And we, we can see from that that as Jesus is teaching this parable, he's wanting us to make some connections. And the first connection is that the master, the one who's distributing these funds, is representing God. And the, the servants who are receiving these funds and being asked to manage them represent us as God's followers and his people. And so the master brings the men in and lines them up and gives the first one five million dollars and the second one two and the last one one. And if you're ever tempted to read this and go, man, why is he being so hard? The guy just had one. He's still got a million dollars to manage. I've never gotten a check with seven zeros on the end of it, unless someone's trying to be funny and put a lot of zeros after the decimal. But, but there's still a significant thing here. And, and what we can see as we look at this is that everything we have comes from God. Everything we have, not just our money, but our money, our health, our family, our job, our 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 stuff, our friends, our careers, everything God has given to us. Even beyond that, you look at things like our actual talents and abilities and strengths and skills are things that God has given to us. And as you look at this passage, it's wanting us to see that, that these are things God's saying, here, I'm giving these to you for you to manage and do well with. 
And if ever we're tempted to go, well, maybe it's, maybe it's something that I've done. Maybe this is my skill and ability that I've developed on my own. Or maybe these blessings I have in my life are, are my doing because I was successful in business or I did well here. But we get even more clear. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. See, this matters because if we understand where things come from, it matters of what we do with them. So if we think that we earn everything, that everything good in our life is because of us and just how awesome we are, that we think we just do whatever we want and there's no accountability, there's no problem with that. But if we pause and think, well, maybe the good things I have in life are indeed from God, as Scripture says, maybe he's given these things to me to manage to take care of, then one, it makes us stop and be grateful and say, God, thank you for giving us these things. But also, how do you want me to manage them? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live my life? Because just as Jesus showed in this parable, we're all going to have to give account for how we took care of the things that God has given us. So then that takes us into the next thing that we see from this, and that is that God is inviting us to invest well. God's inviting us to invest the things that he's given us well. See, the first two servants, they understood this. They took the the talents, the money that the master had given them. They went out and figured out how to invest it, how to trade with it. I don't know exactly what that looked like because they're fake people anyways, but they went and did something with it. And the first one, he said, hey, you gave me five. Here's five more that I earned. And if I've got an investment broker who can double, like, all right, game on. This is cool. And so, you know, the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. The second one. He said, hey, you gave me two, here's two more. Which is interesting, because they both received the very same encouragement. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, enter into my joy. See, it's not about the the number, because both the one that earned five and the one that earned two were both given the same praise and encouragement and congratulations. Then the third one comes forward and says, hey, I was afraid, I just kind of buried it because I knew you were harsh and I knew you'd, you'd, be, you'd be hard on me. And so he did nothing. And so the, the apathy, the, the inaction is what gets the rebuke from the master. And see, as we look at our life, we understand that God has given us all the things that he has in life to invest well, to do things with that make a, an increasing impact. And what I want you to do today is evaluate if you're being like the first two servants who are taking what God's given you and investing it well, or if you're being like the last and effectively just burying it in the sand and moving on. You're just maintaining what God's given you and not investing that well. So I think we've got three areas of our life that we can look at and think about investing well. Uh, And these are gonna be in your your bulletin so you can write these down. But the first is that uh, you need to invest in faith. If you want to live a good year this year who, and, and live a life that God commends and says, well done, good and faithful servant, you need to invest in your faith. And I put this first because it is the, the most important, but probably the easiest for us to neglect as well. Because it's not right there in front of us showing us where we, we're dropping the ball and showing us how we're, we're failing. It, it's a little easy to put it to the side. It's easy to focus on our business. It's easy to even focus on our relationships and people, our goals, our ambitions, but our faith is the thing that's most important. And so this year, how are you investing in your faith? Because it would be foolish of us to, to set goals around our money, to set goals around our fitness, and set goals around even you know intellectual or, or relational goals and miss the goal of investing and growing our faith. In fact, Jesus says these words that are probably kind of haunting for some of us. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So we need to be thinking about how we grow our faith. And, and obviously you are making that some level of priority, which is why you're here today or you're watching online or listening to the podcast. You're, you're making this a priority. So that's the first step. But if you're not sure what it looks like to grow your faith, I wanna give you four ideas of of things you can do to be investing in your faith this year. Uh, And I did not put these in the bulletin because I thought of them after it was already printed. So here are those four things. So the first thing you can do is is read your Bible. And you're like, okay, pastor, we've heard that before. Cool, then do it. Um, But read the Bible. 
Pastor Chad talked about this last week, uh, uh, saying, hey, join us as a church staff of reading through the entire Bible this year. Uh, and I've, I don't know how many times I've had conversations with people, not just in January, just all throughout the year of going, you know, I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to read through the entire Bible, and it can seem so daunting, right? Like, this is like a fairly little one, but there's big ones, and there's a lot of words, 757,000 words, actually, uh, in the ESV translation of the Bible. And if you're trying to do that in one sitting, it is daunting. But you know what's easy? Is if you break it up over 365 sessions, it works out to 10, maybe 15 minutes a day. And this time next year, you can say, yeah, last year I read the entire Bible. And look what God did in my life and what he showed me here and how he helped me here and how much closer I am to him now. And if you're not sure how to break that up, we, there's, a, there's a Bible app that you can download on your phone. If you go to our Facebook page, we got links in there that were posted a few days ago. I think they're gonna be posted on Monday again if you're looking for those. But download that and just work through a few minutes a day, read the Bible and then apply what it says. Second thing you can do if you wanna invest in your faith this year is pray daily. See, we understand that if we want to be closer to our spouse, if we want to be closer to our friends, if we want to get to know someone better, we have to communicate with them. We have to have conversation and shared activity with them to, to grow that relationship. And the same is true of our relationship with God. If we want to be closer to him, we need to be praying regularly. And, and maybe that's uh, an awkward thing for you. And if so, here's a few encouragements. One, it gets easier with time. It's, it's awkward at first, just like if you think back to the first time you talked with your spouse when you're in that like pre-dating phase and you're like, I don't wanna say anything stupid and mess this up. It's, it's the same way, but now it's natural, it's easy. It, it just comes out. It's also easier if you realize that prayer doesn't need to sound like a template. It doesn't need to sound like me or Pastor Chad or some other person that you've heard pray. It should sound like you because it's a conversation between you and God. So it should sound like you and the things that, that matter to you, the things that are going on in your life, the things that are important to you, the way you speak and communicate should be what your prayer sounds like. Because after all, prayer is just you communicating to God and expressing your, your requests, your frustrations, your confession of sins, your gratitude for who he is. So read the Bible, pray. Secondly, make church a priority. And I know that might kind of hit you kind of strange because you're like, well, I'm here, aren't I? Yes, good job. Uh, here's, here's one checked off. But here's what we know from studies. We know that as, as we look at not just our church, but church attendance across the country, that even committed church attenders are attending church less often. And this is something that's been kind of the cornerstone of what it means to walk out the faith of Christianity for the last 2,000 years. And suddenly, people have gone, well, maybe it's not necessary. But Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 25 says that we should not neglect meeting together. We shouldn't neglect this because there's something powerful in being in the same space together. There's something powerful about worshiping together. There's something powerful about hearing God's word taught, about making this time a priority of saying, okay, God, I'm gonna give you this time. What can you teach me? How can I connect with you? So make that a priority this year. And the, the fourth thing is to get connected to a life group. And the good news is, if you're not, you can do that today. See how I did that? I wove that in. He's going on life group signups today. But here's the thing. Some of you, and I know this from talking to some of you, some of you are, are in a place of, of Christian isolation. Your family doesn't believe in God and encourage you in this. Your coworkers don't. Your friends are questioning why you're going to this church thing and how religion's bad and they've got all these theories of how you're getting brainwashed and stuff. And even if you're not, we all need community that's encouraging us and pointing us in the right direction. And life groups are a great way to do that, of saying, hey, we're all trying to walk the same path. We can encourage one another, we can support one another, we can hold each other accountable. And if you think, oh, well, you know, I don't actually need any of those things, one, you're lying, but two, I'll counter that by saying, then you need to be that for someone else. Because there's someone else sitting in the chairs here this weekend that needs a fellow brother and sister in Christ to say, hey, how are you doing? How's the Bible reading going? What's God teaching you? How can I help you this week? So get involved in a life group if you're not. Stop by one of the tables after and do that because we need to make sure in 2023 we're investing in our faith before we start looking at any other thing that we're wanting to grow in. 
But the next thing that we need to invest in is in relationships. See, it's not just the life group side of thing, but, but it's in relationships. It's in all of the, the human interactions that we have in our life. And there's a, a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And in it, uh, one of the habits that he lists, I think it's the second habit, is begin with the end in mind. And I kind of stole that for my title and, and some of how I thought through this message. But in it, he says that we should begin anything that we're doing, whether it's a project or you know, our week or anything that we're doing with how we want that thing to end. And to do this, he, he encourages the readers to, to imagine they're a guest at their own funeral. And, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but he says, hey, if, imagine that you're there as you know, a person sitting in the pews at your own funeral. What do you want them to be saying about you? What are the things they want you to, to, to be remembered by and to, to be said of making a priority and then go and live those things? And this was uh, especially pointed because uh, I was asked to, to host a, a funeral this morning for a, uh, an 18-year-old who was killed in our community tragically. And what was so interesting is I was listening to the, the six people that came up and shared about this young man. Every single one of them focused entirely on their relationship with the young man. Every single one of them, and this is not just this funeral, every funeral I've been a part of, they focus on relationship. They don't talk about the success they had in business or what their GPA in college was or what accolades they had achieved or how awesome their boat was. They talked about the relationship they had. And the way that we can leave a lasting impact on the world is through our relationships. So are you making those a priority? First, if you're married, are you making your spouse a priority? Are you saying, hey, we're gonna have regular, meaningful conversations, not just about logistics, but about life and hopes and dreams? Are you making date nights and getaways a priority? Are you prioritizing your spouse, even over your children, but above your business and your employees and all the other things that are going on? Secondly, are you investing in the relationship with your kids? If you've got kids at home or grandkids that are in your life, Understand, they're there for just a short window of time. You know, when we first had uh, kids, I remember everyone came up and they'd look and we're holding this little baby boy and they're like, oh, he's so cute. And like every single one of them, the next line was always, it goes so fast. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. Until I realized, man, we've, we've got 11 more summers just 11 more years until our oldest graduates and uh, probably moves on to his next phase. It goes so quick. Are you investing in that? Are you focusing on providing and building a business and providing all the things you didn't have as a kid? Because guess what? The thing that they really want is more time with you as their parents. And grandparents, this is the same uh, for you as well. There's an incredible impact you can have but are you investing in relationships in, with your spouse, with your kids if you have them, with people around you, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, the people who God has put in your circle of influence, are you investing in that relationship? Because if we want to live a good life that leaves an impact, it's through the relationships that we have. And the last place that we can focus on investing in this year is investing in purpose. So we've kind of alluded to this uh, throughout the message, but if you, if you look at the parable again, they're, they're, the first two servants are greeted with his well done, good and faithful servant. If you want to live a life that is, that is summarized by God in eternity with well done, good and faithful servant, we have to focus on living the purpose that God has given us, which follows with the question, what is that? And so if we look at Matthew 22, just flip back uh, a page or two in your Bible, Jesus is approached and it says in, uh, in verse 35, it says, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. And the lawyer said, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So he's saying the purpose of our life is to love the Lord our God with everything we have, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says the second most important thing is to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. 
kind of like Jesus saying, the point is to invest in our faith and invest in our relationships. But what we have to do in the midst of this as well is realize all the other things that want to crowd in and, and, and pretend to be the purpose of our life that don't really matter. Because it's so easy to think that the purpose of our life is to, to make a lot of money and to have a good retirement. The purpose of our life is to be successful so we can retire and buy a lake house. Oh wait, some of you did that. Um, <laughs> but it's so easy to think that those are the things that matter. It's so easy to think that the purpose of our life is just to be happy and healthy, but that's so dangerous because life is hard and tragic and difficult and we can't always be happy. But we can't always have joy in Christ knowing that God is with us in our sufferings. It's so easy to think that the purpose of our life is to become significant and famous and so we, we're looking for validation and, uh, and affection from people around us. It's so easy to think that the purpose of our life is even to raise kids who did all the things that we never got to accomplish in our life. And so we smother them by, by trying to make them be something they're not. It's so easy to think the purpose of our life is to check off all the items on our bucket list. And so we spend all of our energy chasing after fleeting things. But the purpose of our life is to follow and serve God and love people. And the amazing thing is that when we make that our priority and we stop chasing money or career or success or validation or accomplishments, God gives us all we're looking for and more. So this year, will you invest in faith? Will you invest in relationships? Will you invest in your purpose that God has given you? Because we're beginning a new year and I challenge you to begin this year with the end in mind. If you, were, you knew you were gonna have a conversation with God on December 31st, 2023, what would you want that to sound like? I'm pretty sure you would wanna hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So how are you going to invest your year this year to make that be a true statement? How are you going to invest in your faith and relationships and purpose to live not just a good year, but a good life? My prayer is that you would do that by following and serving Jesus with everything you have and by loving people as much as you love yourself. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you love us, that you give us these texts that challenge us, that, that make us think about how we're spending our days that you give us. And God, it's so easy to be selfish and self-centered and think that it's all about us. But God, we get these reminders that we're here to serve and follow a God who's so much bigger than us, who's so much more significant and impactful than we could be on our own. And so thank you for the fact that we get to follow and serve you and be a part of what you're doing in our world. And so we pray today that you would help us to live with intentionality and purpose this year. We don't wanna waste any year or month or even day that you give us because we know that life is short. So help us to invest well this year the things that you give us. Invest our time, our energy, our focus in the things that truly matter. And God, convict us when we go astray because we want to live a good year and a good life and hear well done, good and faithful servant. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.